objection. Good evening. This is a meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. It's April 7th, 2016. May I have the attendance? Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Dr. Miles? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Here. Ms. Hartle? Here. Please join me in the pledge. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, there are none. Are, are we still moving into executive session or is that no longer? We're still moving into executive session. Okay. Uh, so there's no, yep. Um, I, <coughs> needless to sure. Needless to say, the budget has consumed uh, some significant energy and time for all of us over the course of uh, this last month, um, and certainly uh, in, in previous months. Uh, we were pleased as a team with the new budget narrative uh, that you have. Um, uh, the feedback from readers has been pretty positive, so we also appreciate that. Uh, this past week has been particularly busy with first readings um, with the uh, town council last night, um, the, the technical first reading in the formal meeting of the board tonight, um, and the leadership council and school board um, joint workshop, uh, the budget workshop that's scheduled for tomorrow. That's scheduled for tomorrow at noontime. Uh, just so you know, there is, um, there is a, a break for lunch, so if you don't, and we do have, we're providing lunch, so if you um, uh, arrive there at noontime, you should be all squared away. Um, it's uh, scheduled, un scheduled until 4 p.m. It's right here in these chambers. Um, it starts at 12, at 4 o'clock is four hours. It's not very likely that we will spend a full four hours on, on that, but um, we've, we've preserved that time in the event that uh, we get involved in some extensive discussions. Um, uh, we're pleased with the uh, budget that was presented last night um, and it's going to be revisited again tonight. I've, in some ways I've, I've repackaged or actually Kate has repackaged for me and given a, a new look to some of the same slides but um, we will take a walk um, through that. I think the important piece to know is that we do believe uh, that what has been presented by the Leadership Council, most of whom I think are sitting out here, um, uh, what, what has been uh, presented um, as the leadership's uh, budget is truly mission critical and we're counting on it staying intact uh, through the rest of the process um, and then being validated uh, with uh, the vote that will happen on June 14th and there was some uh, confusion about where that is happening. The vote is happening at the high school. Um, typically uh, the uh, uh, budget validation referendum uh, happens here. Uh, I don't know about the absentee voting, whether or not that would still happen here. I presume yes, uh, but the actual date, uh, vote of, uh, that's happening on June 14th is going to be happening at the high school. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll move on to uh, some other uh, perhaps even more exciting uh, news. Uh, you were all introduced to our UNIBE uh, students uh, who spent uh, the fall semester with us this year in our K2 schools. Uh, the reciprocal program that's designed for the Scarborough High School students um, is a study exchange in the Dominican Republic and it is hosted by UNIBE and UNIBE is a, a private university um, in Santo Domingo in the, in the Dominican. Um, unfortunately, other programs got a head start uh, and this study exchange did really not, was not able to reach the critical number of participants uh, in order for the program to run this year. However, there's great excitement for the program design, which focuses on a study of the ecosystems of the Dominican Republic uh, while offering participants an opportunity, an immersion opportunity, both in Spanish and in Latin American culture and history. Um, the good news is that the program uh, will be offered for next year with trip, trip dates uh, June 20th uh, through June 29th. Uh, you've got the brochure for more details and we hope to begin to publicize the program uh, more before the end of this school year because oftentimes 
uh, students and their parents are making plans for what they might be doing next year. Uh, the cool thing about this program is it is uh, because of the relationship that we have with UNIBE, it's a very, very affordable program. It's about a nine or ten day um, study, study tour and uh, the amount of uh, the trip is, or the cost for the trip is about $1,650, which is, um, uh, compared to other trips like that, is probably about half uh, the cost. So we're really hoping that um, some of our students take advantage of that. Again, that's not for another year uh, from this June. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, a proposal for the end of the school year commitments. Um, the weather this winter and spring has been a bit challenging to navigate, although I do have to say that I would not change any of the decisions that were made as to the snow days versus no snow days. I think that uh, we made uh, decisions that safely got people to school or safely kept them home when they were supposed to be home. Uh, that being the case, the third and hopefully final storm day of the year, uh, which we had, which was the ice day, I guess, I would refer to it as the ice day, would push the last day of school to Monday, June 20th. And the last day, as you probably know, um, is typically a half day for students and a full day for staff. As we've done in the past, we've tried to plan the wrap-up of our school year in the most logical and student-centered fashion. It seems to me that a half day on Monday, June 20th, would not be a productive use of time for students, parents, or staff. So I hope you'll agree uh, with the following alternative um, as the one that makes best uh, sense for the situation. I'm proposing that Friday, June 17th be the final regular school day for all students. It will be their last day, but it will be a full day, okay? In exchange for the half day on Monday, June 20th, and consistent with our long-term goal number three, which I know you can all recite, but I will, I will, um, I, I will uh, 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 explain it to you or, or uh, share it with you in just a minute. Um, consistent with that goal, well, the goal is uh, to develop in each student the skills for engaged citizenship lo locally and globally, the appreciation of one's own and other's cultures, and the disposition to use individual talents to make positive changes in the world. It's goal three, long-term goal. Um, we would declare June 20th as Scarborough School's Day of Community Service, Civic Learning, and Service Learning, and that would be K-12. We'd ask parents to partner with us to ensure that their students spend at least the equivalent of a half day in service um, or in learning within the community. Each of the schools will be circulating ideas for engagement and involvement that would be suitable for the various age levels that we have across the schools. We'll also, however, encourage students and parents to help us strengthen student-directed community service, civic learning, and or service learning by encouraging students of all ages to have a voice in what aspect of community service or service of civic learning that they would really like to explore. So that would be a great work and a great partnership in terms of the community, parents, and students uh, to really be pursuing one of our important goals. It's one of three of our student-centered goals. Um, and yes, there will be accountability because each school will spend some time during the first week of, of school next year, the new school year, processing the learning with students. And since the summer is a good long break, we'd also encourage students and parents to jot down a journal entry for that day um, in anticipation of at least a couple or a few questions that come to mind, I'm going to give you the answers. No, it does not have to happen on June 15th. The summer provides great leeway in terms of opportunity. So if it can't happen on the 15th, it can happen sometime thereafter that's convenient or there might be a road race that kids want to help out at that's already scheduled or whatever it might be. So the first answer is no. It does not have to happen on June 15th. 20th, 20th. Um, okay, June 20th. Um, or, or June 15th. No. <laughs> it doesn't have to happen on any particular day. <laughs> All right, it doesn't have to happen on any particular day in June or, elsewhere or, or otherwise. Um, the second answer is uh, no, it does not have to be limited to just a half day. In fact, I'm hoping, and what we hope 
through these kind of experiences, particularly with student voice involved, is that it's the beginning of something that, uh, that catches on and something that maybe leads to some new experiences uh, that had not been anticipated. So uh, who knows where this exploration of service and learning may take our students. And lastly, uh, the answer to the third question is yes, I will be checking in on the incomes, uh, on the outcomes in terms of, of what's happening. It, I may be um, a little distance away, but I will be checking in. So those are the three questions I've anticipated and answers. I hope that um, the board is in agreement with my plan. Sounds good. Great. I'm I'm getting, I don't. Oh, yeah. I don't need a vote. I just we need, need smi smiling, smiling just faces. Need okay. So, yeah. yeah. I'm. No, yeah. I. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, recognition. Um, the first uh, piece of recognition I want to do is uh, relates to the middle school and their uh, tremendous effort around Red Storm Strikes Out Cancer, and. Um, Once again, it was a huge success, it is making a big difference in the fight against cancer. This is the sixth year in a row. Uh, the middle school was the top fundraising team in all of Mary's Walk. With close to 100 walkers and runners, they were also the largest team to participate. One of the key components that helps uh, Red Storm Strikes Out Cancer make such a difference is the level of involvement from the students and the staff. Every year, hundreds and hundreds of students recognize the need to get involved and find a cure for cancer. This year was no different than the last seven. Red Storm Strikes Out Cancer is successful only because our students and staff attend meetings, make signs, collect and count money, cut out ribbons, sell t-shirts, donate money, walk or run at Mary's Walk, and participate, volunteer, and watch the staff versus students, uh, the staff v. students uh, basketball game. When you really think about how many students and staff make it a priority to get involved, we can all realize how important it is to find a cure. It's also important to find a passion. Um, and uh, it's uh, Doug Bennett who has a, a great passion uh, along with the, uh, a whole bunch of other adults and students who make this happen. This year, they've raised well over $10,000 so far. There may be a final tally by this time, I don't know. Money was still coming in. This means that the last seven years, Red Storm Strikes Out Cancer has raised a total of almost $100,000. That's amazing. This kind of money means that new equipment can be purchased, new staff, uh, I presume research staff can be hired and the research can be extended due to the generosity of time and money of the students and the staff of the Scarborough Middle School. So congratulations. And the last uh, statement that I received is we will find a, a cure. So that ties in nicely with that day of service, surf, service learning, et cetera. And um, I have one other item. And um, that relates to the 2016 MPA Principals Award recipient. Um, I believe that that person has been identified. Is that correct, Mr. Creech? Could you come on up? The criteria for this award are academic excellence, outstanding school citizenship, and leadership. And I'll let David uh, share with you who the award winner is this year. Good evening. Good. Um, if it's okay with you, I want to give a little bit of background before I announce who this hmm? recipient is. But um, uh, each year, as Dr. Entwistle mentioned, um, every principal in the state of Maine, and this is over 100 high school high schools that are a part of the Maine Principals Association gets to pick a senior for this award and it's very prestigious. There is a, a luncheon that happened last Saturday and the recipient gets a uh, three hour ride with me to Bangor and back, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is the highlight of the experience but I'm, I can't be certain. Um, and this particular recipient this year benefited from the fact that she had to go to Chicago to visit a college and was not able to go to Bangor with me. Uh, so it's her loss, or I think it's her gain. But uh, on, on a more serious note, I uh, have become a, a huge fan of this young lady, uh, tremendously proud of the young leader that she's become. Um, to name a few of uh, the e enormous impact that she's had on our school, uh, not only is she a, a very strong and successful student, uh, which is evidenced by the challenging courses she takes and her success in the classroom, she also is a member of the Interact Club, Key Club, Model United Nations, and a member of the Scarborough School Board. Ah. 
Um, in addition to that, she has such honors, very distinguished honors, as the Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership Ambassador, an honorary page for the Maine State Senate, a foreign diplomat for the Model United Nations, and a member of the National Honor Society. Uh, in addition to those clubs and organizations, um, she was instrumental this year and last year in developing student voice at our school and ensuring that student leaders were a part of our schedule change process, be involved in understanding the budget. Uh, I have seen her grow and mature into an outstanding young leader. So on behalf of the Maine Principals Association, I can't give this to her tonight because <laughs> she needs to get it at the May Awards Banquet, but it is my honor and privilege to recognize Emma Hartle. Thank you. Can we get a photo of you? With yeah. Oh, yeah. Right now? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, if you wouldn't mind, I'm sure her parents might appreciate that. <laughs> sure. There you go. And give it <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I, your head was not in the left hand. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you, Mancy. That's uh, my report. There's totally point out that she has report. Um, just a quick uh, thank you, and that would be to the screening committee that probably spent a lot more hours than they ever thought they were going to have to <laughs> do on the superintendent search process. So that involved 16 people, uh, was well represented by people within and without of the uh, school system, as well as on the board. So. Uh, I really, truly want to thank those people for all the time they gave and, and their work there. And congratulations to Emma. Well. Thank you. <laughs> 7.0 committee reports. Who would like to start? Mrs. Shea? I will start. Um, the finance committee has been meeting regularly. Shocking, I know. Um, and we are now in full swing. Getting the budget um, starts the process for us. So we're very excited. We want to thank all of the leadership. It's, it's a great budget. We're impressed with the amount of time and energy you all had to put into it, so thank you for that. And we look forward to sort of continuing the conversation with the months to come. And, and the public will have an opportunity over the course of the next two months to voice um, opinions and ask questions. We have, I think we'll probably tell this to the public every time we possibly can, but we have the budget forum, which will happen on April 27th at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. It will be similar in format to how it was last year. And starting as of last night after the first reading to the town council, questions are being accepted on the town website, and we will also post a link to that page on our Facebook page. Very good. Mrs. Murphy? So the policy committee, um, we had a brief hiatus. Uh, just, I'm not sure that we'll be able to fit a meeting in around all the budgetary requirements um, meetings this month, but in our previous meetings, we've talked about a new medical marijuana policy being included in the prescription medications on campus, even though it's not a prescription, it's a certification, it's different rules about it, so we are, um, talking about adding that to our policy. We next will be looking at um, a child abuse policy, updating that with some new guidelines from the state and from Drummond and Woodsum. Um, we also reviewed the wellness policy, which you'll hear more about, which is an incredible um, remake, do-over of what existed before. It took several years and a huge committee, and we so, so appreciate it because it was incredible amount of work that the policy committee alone could never have handled, nor did we have the expertise. So thank you to that committee for all the work. Um, and we will be meeting again hopefully soon and we will publish the date when that comes up. I know we have another request to um, review policy KF, the facilities policy. Looking at Mr. Jepson. So um, we will be um, reviewing that again. That one seems to take a lot of real estate, but we will um, we'll be looking at that one again shortly. And Mrs. Messenfield? 
Uh, Long Range Facilities Plan is uh, waiting to meet with uh, Harriman Association Associates, Dan Cecil, um, so that's yep. coming up soon, hopefully, next week, next week mm -hmm. if the schedule is all set with that. So Very good. Yeah. Um, it's fairly quiet on the Communications Committee as well in the past month. Uh, we've been focusing on the Facebook page, trying to make sure that the public understands the important dates coming up in respect to the budget process, uh, and that's been about it. Yes, negotiations? Uh, negotiations are scheduled. Uh, we think that we're going scheduled. To, uh, we've been scheduled and we've had to postpone and postpone for various reasons. We are currently scheduled for the 28th. Is that, that date is still mm -hmm. ongoing, yeah. right? So uh, the com our our team is going to meet next Wednesday to make certain of what we are going to be presenting. Uh -oh. And then uh, for the legislative committee, uh, we held uh, the school boards and superintendents had a joint meeting uh, Friday the 25th. That was the day that we had a little rain. Fortunately, the meeting wasn't until noon, and I had decided I would go. And uh, fortunately, I had no problems driving to Augusta. By that time, it was all rain. And as you know, the governor is pushing forth a, an initiative. He formed a committee to be looking at ways, uh, well, He wants to talk about how to do the budget but he, and how to allocate funds, and he has formed this committee, but he only, he handpicked the participants in the committee. Uh, the main school management association had only one pick, so to speak, so we have chosen a superintendent who has, has some knowledge, ongoing knowledge about this. So we had an excellent meeting. It is the first time both the superintendent and school board members of the legislative committee have sat down together to discuss a problem. And I have the impression we will do it again because, as I say, it was very productive. And I'm glad I went. People who could not make it were there on Skype. Uh, we had superintendent from Fort Kent come down, but he came down the night before, so we had full participation. You need to know, our educators and our parents especially need to know that the members of this school board and its superintendent and those members and superintendents across the state are always at the legislature fighting for what is best for students and to try and improve our position with regards to uh, charter schools and online schools. And we just don't sit on our hands and try and do policy here. We try and participate and support at a state level as well. Uh, is there anything new regarding a commissioner of education at the state level since nope. at this time we have no one? Is that right? Well, the, the former president of Hudson is still in an acting position and what the governor has said is that if there is something that has to be signed by the commissioner then he will do the signing. He the governor will do the signing. It is, it is disconcerting uh, that the governor has not presented a budget and, and everybody needs to know that. The governor never submitted a budget. And that is what is making things uh, so very difficult for our legislative groups in Augusta to try and formulate a budget. Because when they put something forward, the governor says, no, Bob, I'm going to veto that or whatever it happens to be. So we've gone back to being contentious. Fortunately, it has not trickled down to Scarborough and I don't expect that it will. 
Thank you. Uh, 8.0, the student report. Emma, do you want to? Sure. Um, so quarter three wrapped up last Friday, and quarter four has started off well for lots of students and staff. Um, March 29th, which was last Tuesday, was the last uh, chorus cabaret of the year. And March 30th, last Wednesday, was the Storm for a Cure Trivia Bee. And each team contributed a donation of at least $10 towards cancer research. And both the winning and the runner-up teams happened to be teams of teachers. So <laughs> we have to say <laughs> good job on your smart teachers and wonderful, <laughs> <laughs> intelligent teachers. And trivia, anyway. Right. <laughs> um, and Project Grad posted our hypnotist on April 2nd, where uh, students and families and community members all came out to watch student volunteers get hypnotized. And it was a huge success. Uh, Project Graduation raised over $4,000. So that was a great success. Um, tonight, actually at 6 o'clock at the high school, was the Canadian College Fair. So prospective students who wish to go to Canada for perhaps cheaper tuition, um, they have the opportunity to meet with representatives from ca Canadian colleges tonight. On April 12th, which is coming up, um, we have a day that is different from the usual proceedings. Uh, the juniors will be participating in, S in SATs that day, so to accommodate for them having a different schedule and not having students moving around during the day and having them miss out on a day. Uh, the seniors will be taking the day to formulate uh, preparation for college or career readiness. Um, they'll be doing things like job shadowing, finishing scholarship applications or applications to colleges if those haven't gotten in. Uh, next year, the, those students will be participating in a financial literary seminar, literacy seminar. Um, that just wasn't able to happen this year, but that's what will be going on next year. The ninth and 10th graders on April 12th, they will be participating in a day of college and career experiences. Um, so in the morning, they will have vocational presentations from the Westbrook and Pass vocational schools. Um, the ninth graders then will be visiting SMCC, and the tenth graders will be visiting UNE and USM. They'll be participating in tours, they'll rotate through the schedule, they'll have faculty presentations, and they will even get to participate in lunch with students who are at the colleges, and that'll be a great opportunity for them. And of course, that day was made possible for them uh, with the school and business partners, and of course, Scarborough High School. And then April 15th, of course, starts out our April vacation with our day off for students. And on the middle school, the second annual Trivia Bee, or Junior, junior Trivia Bee, was, will be on April 12th at Wentworth School at 6.30. Teams are competing for best costume and best in category. The categories include history, <coughs> math, science, geography, and pop culture. Um, spring sports tryouts have been this week for girls across, baseball, softball, and girls and boys track and field. Uh, students have participated in MEA testing in math and ELA in the past week also. The practice tests were held March 29th through April 1st, and the official testing took place Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week. All right. So I have a fairly short report this week. Um, first thing it says is Wentworth finished their week of MEA testing yesterday. Is that true or was that the middle school? Wentworth. Oh, Wentworth. Wentworth? Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> um, so the PTA will be holding a family movie night tomorrow actually at 6 p.m. Um, and then for the primary schools um, they just kind of wrapped up their kindergarten registration window from March 28th to March 31st. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. May I add one? Yes. Uh, there is a spaghetti dinner at the middle school on the 14th at 5.30, uh, which is a fundraiser for the softball team. I went last year. It's great. <laughs> the dads were cooking the spaghetti and the sauce. <laughs> Oh, we all want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So at this point in time, I'm going to open it up to the citizens, anyone sitting here this evening who wish to come to the podium to make a comment. Seeing none, we will close that portion of the meeting. 9.0, recognition, Dr. Entwistle. Um, I think I did my recognition already as part of my report. 10.0, new business. 10.1, <coughs> the meeting minutes of March 10th. Do I have a motion? Move approval is printed. Second. Any discussion, corrections, anything you saw that? Very good. I'll abstain from this as I wasn't here. So, okay. all in favor? Two, three, four, five, plus one, five plus one, and two abstain. And 10.2, first reading of policy JLAA, the wellness policy. Kate. Kate. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to stand here and not mention a number. <laughs> uh, and uh, if you have any questions with numbers in them, you might want to defer them to the next topic. Um, I'm standing here as a representative of a terrific group. There's a few of my uh, colleagues over here in the second row that have come to support me tonight. As Kelly mentioned earlier, um, there's been a team working on the new wellness policy for our district for at least two years. Um, this effort was kicked off, as so many of our efforts are, uh, by a need to comply with some regulations coming down from the federal folks, uh, particularly in the USDA. They have uh, instructed local school districts to rewrite their wellness policies to be in compliance with some of the uh, best practices for kids in order to be able to participate in the free and reduced lunch program, which of course we do here in Scarborough. So that was our initial um, impetus for taking on this challenge. But really once the team dug into this, uh, it became more of an effort to find out what those best practices were and to identify the kinds of policy uh, elements that would allow us to serve our kids best um, and also our staff here in Scarborough. So the policy that you've seen the draft of and you have for first reading this evening um, represents sort of a collation of some of the best things that we're doing in Scarborough, some of the best things that we've been able to find that other districts have done and other communities, and uh, what we hope will be a framework for some really nice uh, initiatives in the schools going forward. Um, once the policy is reviewed and passed, we do have a plan to roll it out to the staff and to make sure that folks have their resources and the understanding and some of the great ideas that we've been given uh, to be able to put some of these things in place. Um, it's not in its substance drastically different from what we've done before, but I think in its intent and its scope um, and its, uh, its quality, it may be a little bit stronger, if I can say it that way. So I just wanted to recognize the team. Uh, there's a, a bunch of other folks out there who have been working very hard on this and we hope that you will pass this for us tonight. As a member of the policy committee, I just want to say thank you. It is both very forward and very holistic in its thinking. I'm really excited about it and you all just did amazing work. So um, I'm incredibly enthusiastic. Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? Well, we, don't we need a motion first? Yes. Yeah. Will of the board? Move approval is presented. Second. Discussion? Yeah, like I said, it's just, I, I went to some of the early meetings of the Wellness Committee and even then, that was like two years ago, um, it was a moving target. Still the regulations were just being unveiled piece by piece and it was a very big task. So it just seems like I need everyone to know it's just one policy, but it was like a big deal. It was based on a lot of um, reimbursement from the USDA that we had to comply with and have specific things. And it took a few attempts, but this um, latest iteration is fantastic. It really is, um, it covers such a, a breadth of topics that 
um, previously were, would never even be considered in the policy. So it was a big job and spurred on because it was required for some funding, but I think the end result is just something we'd want to have anyway. So I really appreciate all the work that went into it. Anyone else? Jackie? Yes, I, I think uh, this is a wonderful document and I hope that I expect that we will all be able to comply with it. I, I just had a question on something that I felt is, uh, has been omitted, and that is the number of children we have who are allergic to certain foods, and how do we prevent that? Uh, I, perhaps you addressed it and found that it didn't need to be in the policy? or. Well, we, we did talk about it quite a bit, Jackie, because obviously that's a concern, um, particularly in talking about food in general and nutrition. Um, but there is a separate policy that covers allergies and how we deal with those in the schools that, okay. that's pretty in-depth. So we felt as though we didn't necessarily need to tackle that again in this particular policy. Um, I think you know, Kelly could speak to that a little bit, but basically there, there is another policy out there that's very prescriptive in terms of how allergies are, are handled. That's absolutely true, and there is a part of this policy. I mean, obviously food is discussed in several spots, um, but one part, I think, the, it talks about um, rewards other than food, and I think that is also in part sensitive to the kids in the classrooms that do have allergies so they can feel a part of a celebration in the class. So I think it's not outlined in there, but there's definitely reference and um, accommodations within the policy for children with, with allergies, and like Kate said, there is another policy that specifically deals with it. So. Then perhaps at the bottom of the policy, and I think we have done this with other policies, refer to the policy mm -hmm. on allergies. You could put a note cross -reference. that yeah. cross-references it, yeah. And to Kelly's point, that's absolutely the case. I mean, a lot of what we talked about um, in terms of classroom celebrations and events in the schools, um, we had a lot of conversation around inclusiveness. And um, for any number of reasons, one particular choice uh, for a celebration of food may not be an appropriate choice right. for every child um, or for every family. And so we really felt like the, um, that moving away from that would be helpful for kids uh, in general. Great job, truly. Anyone else? All in favor of this motion? which is to accept as the first reading of policy JLAA, the wellness policy. Seven plus two, thank you. 10.3, second reading of the 16-17 school calendar. Yes. Yeah. Um, what is being brought forth tonight um, as the uh, final recommendation from uh, the superintendent and the leadership council is um, option three. Um, that is um, part, of, part of the packet. Um, what I've included uh, this evening, I believe at, the, at your um, place here, is um, a copy of the NIASC profile sheet in the event that people um, are unfamiliar with NIASC. And um, the third piece that I've provided is um, something that David had uh, put together in terms of professional learning at the high school, uh, looking at the existing uh, professional uh, development time uh, that uh, he has currently and how that's used, uh, the rationale for the additional professional development time, um, and specifically we're referring it to that as NEASC uh, self-study time. Uh, but you can see that it's, it's really quite connected to a tremendous amount of other pieces that are also in motion. Uh, the rationale for adding late start Wednesdays uh, and the implications um, in terms of lack of uh, that additional pro professional development time. I know that there was some interest um, as well on the part of some middle school parents saying that they would really like to have the additional uh, late start uh, added. And quite frankly, that is not part of our proposal and not something that we would support at this time. Uh, Barbara and her team have had the time to really look at um, and modify schedule and organization uh, in a way that affords 
uh, the faculty there um, more opportunity for learning time that's embedded in, in their regular workday. Um, as you know, in the, at the high school, that is just not there. Um, anything that we are addressing uh, really needs to be uh, carved out. So it is, um, it is option, or it's referred to, I guess, as draft three, uh, that we would um, ask the board to consider and adopt uh, so that we can move forward with a 2016-2017 school calendar. Is there a motion on the floor? Who approval is presented? Second. Discussion? Anyone? Okay. I fully endorse and support the need for professional development time at all of the grade levels and especially at the high school. I know that it's incredibly important um, and I really want to support that. But, but having been on two NEASC self-studies and having been the lead author on one NEASC self-study, I really am uncomfortable with the idea of late starts for that work. And I just, I, David, I want to ask, isn't there any other way that we can do this? Do you want to come up? Before I answer your question, I just returned yesterday from an EASC accreditation visit where I spent four days at another high school. And um, of course, when you have an EASC accreditation visit, everything has to be confidential. I can tell you that um, it significantly impacts a school that's being accredited if an appropriate amount of time is not provided to that school for this professional development. It's a part of that process. So I think what is important for everyone to understand is that NEASC is a form of professional development. And as I had mentioned in one of my presentations, it is an organization soup to nuts examining everything we do from policy to curriculum, assessment, instruction, culture, leadership, everything that we do. And it's a very intense self-study that we lead. So in order to conduct that self-study, which is an enormous amount of work to align with the seven standards that allow us to be accredited as a high school by NEASC, there needs to be time. What is also has been made very, very clear by NEASC, and it's just common sense as far as I'm concerned, is that NEASC professional development in the form of a self-study should never replace existing professional development. There are some wonderful things happening at the high school and at the other schools in our district. We are working very hard for a student-centered approach to improve curriculum, schedules, that we have a number of things that we're already working on. I know for a fact, knew that before I went to this visit, but it is seen as detrimental to the progress of a school if we put that on the shelf and replace the work that we've already been doing with an EAS self-study because the work that we're doing right now is the work we're supposed to be doing. The work the NEAC self-study asks us to complete is a very comprehensive, intense, additional form of professional development that schools should go through. So to answer your question, we have exhausted our options. We have maximized by contract with all the time that we've been given. Everything that we're currently doing is maxed. If we take on the self-study and we take that professional development on and we want to do this well and ensure that we are investigating everything we do and to make sure that Scarborough High School is offering all that we should for our students, we need additional time. Do you have an argument for critics, because there are critics out there, do you have an argument for critics who say that taking time away from instruction in which in order to evaluate and prove your competency in instruction is at best counterintuitive, right? I mean, because on the face it looks that way, right? So how would you respond to those critics? So I have uh, two responses to that. Uh, data indicates that one of the direct correlations to improve student learning is improving teacher expertise. Other factors that are part of the standards from NEASC are what do we have for assessments? What's our curriculum? What's the school culture? What is our leadership doing? Not just leadership of the high school, but leadership from school boards, district leadership, uh, the entire leadership for the school. All of those practices, organizational structures, everything that we do that are part of the seven standards, NEASC allows us 
to investigate that, to see if we are doing what we should be doing. They make recommendations. We make recommendations based on our self-study. And so hopefully we find and validate the things that we're doing well and continue to do those things, find areas that we need to improve and take those things on. All of those seven standards, if we take recommendations and improve in those, will have a direct correlation with student learning. And so some of them aren't measurable, quantifiable, but all of them directly impact student learning. What we're already doing as a school district is also hugely impactful for what is the most important goal that we should have, and that is improve student learning. So I'm happy that people have thrown out the numbers game, and people like to look at the large number, the loss of instructional hours, but I'm going to take a moment to share with you the actual impact. So nine late starts is not 13.5 hours, it's 11.25 hours over the course of 178 school days. For classes, it means on one day that week, if you happen to be one of those five classes that are being held, because as the girls can attest, we have a rotating schedule. Five classes over seven days, they meet five times over seven days, not every day. For each class, one late start means you have 10 minutes less time from 60 minutes to 50 minutes, which is manageable for teachers. Over the course of the entire school year, nine late starts are going to equate to about two hours of lost time per class over 178 days. So mathematically, it's a minimal impact to each class. Yeah, if you look at the total number of hours over the course of a year, it would look like, oh my gosh, I can't believe those classes are losing that much time. Over 178 days, each class will lose about two hours of instructional time. On one day, one week, 10 minutes of class time. So is the work that we're going to do for those nine late starts and all those other days that we have going to have a significant impact on students? Yes. On the organization? Yes. Is it worth about two hours of class time a year? Absolutely. It's invaluable. In addition to that, critics have said to me, you're also taking instructional time away for the academic enrichment and support time. And these girls can attest to the fact that, and I've mentioned this before, and I know I'm preaching to the choir on this, we have a very busy, high-powered set of students at Scarborough High School who are maxed with their time before school, after school, jobs, volunteering, sports, activities, you name it. Schools don't accommodate the needs of all students. Schools accommodate the needs of some students when it comes to that enrichment and support. Because not every student's study hall is aligned with a teacher's prep. Not every student can come after school. Not every student can come before school. We are going to embed in a schedule 35 minutes every single day for every single student at Scarborough High School to have enrichment and academic support because it's a priority of ours and it's going to make a huge difference in their success in the classroom. So that is one of the things that we decided was worth five less instructional minutes per class per day from 65 minutes to 60 minutes. So. Um, I guess I'd end with this piece for those critics that you've been speaking to. Um, I'm a pretty simple <coughs> guy. I, I believe that we need the community to trust us as school leaders, that we have examined thoroughly every possible option that's available to us, and what we're putting forward is the best option available for Scarborough High School. Thanks. Donna? Any other questions? So I just want to say that um, Carrie and I already made David go through all this for us. Like, so we were like the, screen, the screening committee for that speech because we honestly were not sold on it and not for any other reason except we kept hearing from people, we don't want to lose instruction time, we don't want to lose instruction time. So I absolutely appreciate your breaking it down minute by minute because there is the misconception that um, it's hours and hours. So thank you for doing that. 
Thank you for being a math teacher and handling that for us. <laughs> so we absolutely understand that now. But I think it's interesting to note the number of emails we've received since draft three went live last week. It's actually, I think, weighted in favor of people wanting more late starts. Mm -hmm. They're, asking every They're asking for every Wednesday because they think three is going to be hard to manage to remember what week is, if it's a late start or not. So they're saying, if we're doing three, why don't we just do four? Um, I'm not saying I necessarily am advocating a change in that right now. We'll <laughs> take I every late start. <laughs> there's, there's now an, uh, an draft option, four. option four, yeah. four on the table. Would you pull that out? Um, for the high school. Only for the high, only for the high school. school. Only for the high school, I should say. <laughs> but, I'm, but I think that's interesting that people, some of the same people who were vocally opposed last year have completely turned around on the late starts. Now that they've lived it and they see that their kids like it, I have yet to run into a family that doesn't, that their child doesn't appreciate and enjoy the late start. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that the kids who ride the bus to the high school and sit around necessarily love it every time because they're still waking up at the same time, but the majority of kids that I've talked to, <coughs> and the girls are shaking their heads down, their head, they really appreciate the extra time to sleep. You may have heard that I'm in favor of changing the late start, the school start time so that it's later start every day. So if we can do it on a more regular basis for the high school and get something out of it professionally for the staff and for the self-study, I'm now a believer that it's, <laughs> the time is well spent. Hey, Ms. Jody. And then Karen. Um, I have two things I'd just like clarified. One is, if I remember correctly, and my memory is not good, um, didn't teachers and staff volunteer time during a summer to start this whole process almost a year and a half ago? No? Is that something else that they volunteered their time for? Um, that, I, don't, I don't know that. No? Okay. There's staff development that's budgeted by departments for curriculum work and those types of things, but that, that hasn't happened for this. Yeah. No. Okay. And then can you explain a little bit just for the general public to understand what it means to be accredited, like what does that mean to their student? I've had people say, well, do we have to be accredited? You know, why is that such a big deal? So I just think people don't understand the importance of mm -hmm. that action. Or how long it's been since we've done it. Sure, so I could spend several meetings giving you all the benefits to accreditation. Um, sure, well, we've had days of meetings, so. <laughs> <laughs> so let me try to, okay, so. One, the accreditation process is something that's not supposed to be just done next year, put it on the shelf, and 10 years later we're going to come back and be accredited again. It's exactly what I described to you a minute ago. It is a form of professional development. It is an in-depth, comprehensive look at what a school does. The seven standards are very specific. You have your culture, your values, your core values and beliefs, uh, how you assess students, your instruction, the curriculum that's taught, the culture of the school, the leadership, the school resources, the community resources, all seven of those standards are examined. So what the benefits that the community should feel good about is Scarborough High School will be going through a very comprehensive self-study and evaluation by a team of colleagues of other educators from other schools that are going to ensure that Scarborough High School has everything we should have in place in regards to those standards. And all those seven standards that I just mentioned to you are things that we should all be doing very well. By all, I mean every school for students. So it's, for people in the business world, it's, you know, my wife works at Maine Medical Center, and when that group comes in to investigate everything that happens at Maine Medical Center, and I'm embarrassed, I forget what they're called, but they, everybody gets nervous at the hospital because they're holding the hospital to very high standards, and they should for the patient's sake. And when the hospital gets accredited and passes that, it's making people who send their, their loved ones to that school feel uncomfortable. It's the same thing with the high school. We will have, at the end of that self-study, and when the evaluation team comes and spends four very high-powered, strong days looking at all of our evidence, Meeting when I spent the last four days, I spent more time in the classroom the last four days and with students than I spent in an entire month at Scarborough High School. And it's very, very thorough. You examine everything the school is doing. You talk to all of the stakeholders. You have honest feedback. And what we do as 
a visiting team is take the self-study and our site visit and NIAS takes all those results and makes a recommendation to the school. And from that, we develop, similar to our 24-month improvement plan, a two-year plan and a five-year plan. So, sorry. At Scarborough High School two years ago, we decided that we wanted to be an organization like really good teachers. Really good teachers every day examine what they do in the classroom to make sure it's what's best for students. That's what really good teachers do. When you do that, as a teacher every day, you either validate the things that you're doing, you understand you need to make some changes and you tweak things so that it's, for the best, it's best for the students, or you realize what you're doing is not what's best for students and you change. We're trying to do that as a high school for the last two years. This process puts us on the road to do that. We identify those things we need to work on and it becomes a part of what the organization does, not every 10 years, every single year. We're working to improve those things. So accreditation status from NEASC will let the community know there's been an in-depth study done for Scarborough High School. And if NEASC accredits us as a high school, our, our children are in a very good high school that's providing them everything a high school should provide them. Okay, thank you. And, and David, it's not just the, that it's important to the community. It is important to the universities and colleges that are looking at your graduates. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carrie, you next? Yes, um, I wanted to second what Kelly was saying about the emails that have kind of surprised us, really, that parents have said if we're having three, might as well have all of the Wednesdays be late starts. It's more confusing. I was just counting up. There's, there would only be nine, maybe ten Wednesdays that were not late start Wednesdays. I would imagine those Wednesdays would feel a little odd <laughs> at the school. Um, I wanted to also reiterate that I feel um, it's unfortunate that we can't move to a later start time for the high school for next year. This doesn't solve the problem, but it goes a little ways towards helping kids get enough sleep at least one night of the week. Um, and I would add that I don't see four late starts a month for the high school as the long-term solution. I'd rather see it shift to a later start time and figure out what professional development time looks like under a new model. So I wouldn't be saying, let's do this forever, mm -hmm. but I could see for <coughs> next year why that might make sense. Um, I have a question and a comment. The question is, so, so we institutionalize it as a NEASC late start this year. What does it look like the following year? Will we still have those days and call it something different, or will they revert back to a regular start? So it's almost like we coordinated this, because my notes are right in line with your question. I, I looked at your notes while you were out of the room. <laughs> so in, in anticipation of that, as, you, as I mentioned a minute ago, there is a two-year and a five-year plan that's created from this. And so there will be work to be done to improve in certain areas. I mean, we're a good school. We want to be a great school. We don't want to be just good in two or three of the standards. We want to be great in all seven. So we know there's going to be recommendations. This will provide us the opportunity to collaboratively address whatever those recommendations are and put into practice whatever needs to be done. So the two and five year plan is part of the accreditation process. So that time will be spent taking on those additional initiatives that perhaps are identified through the NEAS process. So again, I totally support professional development time. I also totally support a later start. I am going to abstain from this vote, not because I am against professional development time, but because um, at the last meeting I asked you what the ideal was, and you said, you know, in an ideal world we would be able to pay our teachers extra and they'd be able to stay later, come early. That's the model I favor. I really want to push us towards that model, and so that's why I'm going to be abstaining. Jody? I think it's also important to know that we are moving to that model. Um, in this year's budget, which um, is next to come. So w what is in that budget is a day's worth of time, but not necessarily a day. You know, it would be six and a half hours or seven hours yeah. of time. And I think for, for me, I can speak for myself, I view that as the first step. And I view this calendar sort of as the plug to the hole until we get there. So for me, I feel like let's invest in the time for this coming year with this calendar, knowing that in our budget, we're moving towards the ideal model of embedding it in our school day. So hopefully after next year's budget, there'll be more time. Um, so that's sort of where I stand on that. I feel like we're moving in that direction, and that's 
what gives me the confidence to vote the way I'll vote. Yes, we I, I think I'm the only one who's here who has a student at the high school currently. Um, and I would just like to say that I took an unofficial poll of several of my daughters, uh, my daughter's a freshman, um, her friends who said, oh, I would do that every Wednesday. That's great. And I said, well, what about if you don't have a ride to the high school on those Wednesdays? And they said, well, sometimes we carpool, like the parent, a parent, one parent will take a turn each time to carpool for the kids. Or they say, well, if I know that I had a lot of work, I can do that hour in the morning at school. Or I have the option then if my parent can drive me, then I can sleep in. And so I think that they, the kids, the students, have a sense of, I have several options. So I might have a ride, but I might decide that I want to go in on the bus because I want to get my, some work done. Or I have that option of staying in bed because I have that other option too. So my daughter's, unof the unofficial poll of several of my daughter's friends has been, they would like it, they'd really like it all the time, but we know we can't do that this year. But they would go for all the Wednesdays. You, so. you said you can't do that this year. I thought Dr. Entwistle said there might be a so option, minute, four. option, option four. Oh, four. oh did you? Okay. Um, but every Chris, day? Christy and I can one up you on that because I did an official poll Ooh. of every kid that was in the cafeteria on their last <laughs> late start, and they all uh, told me that it really? is a good thing and they will take as many as they can get. I, I did read that on your Facebook page, so thank you. Would you accept a friendly amendment that was for every Wednesday? Absolutely. Yeah. As a matter of fact, our original proposal was for every Wednesday, and some right. of the reasons you stated were part of the rationale. Then I offer a friendly amendment that we change it to every Wednesday. And what that means whoever moved can accept without discussion. Well, it, it, yes, you have the option of whether you vote on it or not. Right. But are, are you saying then that you would then not abstain? I don't know yet, but oh. I'm just offering a friendly amendment. <laughs> okay. So, Jackie? I just want to tell people there are some of you sitting out there who know that at one time we had a 185-day school year for the staff. We gave those days up because of budget constraints. When we started, a day cost us $75,000. A day cost us over $100,000. Uh, $130,000. $130, $130,000. The school board is, is, has made a commitment to try and buy back those, other, those three days that we gave up, mm -hmm. starting with this budget uh, and one. And I can tell you that the teachers have just bought it. They never said no. They said, you want to pay for a day, uh, we'll work it. You use the time the way you think is best for the district. So the teachers have never, ever balked at it. And uh, the community needs to know that. Thank you, Jackie. Um, are any of our high school students wish to chime in on anything right now? I mean... I'm not, I'm not going to say no to four late starts. I mean, those extra hour or so of sleep, it's absolutely fantastic. And I think talking to some of my friends, I mean, a lot of us either drive themselves or we can get rides to school, but there have been times when I have had to go into school either to talk to a teacher early who happened to be free, and that was just my luck, or I had something that I needed to do on a computer and I couldn't use the internet at home. Um, but I think the late starts are really fantastic and I think it's really helpful for students. So if it's helpful for the teachers from a professional development standpoint as well, then I think I don't really, in my mind, I don't see a reason for it to stop or for us to only limit it to the two days that it is now. So Emma? I'm in favor. Oh. I would definitely agree with that. Um, I'd also like to say it's just, it's a huge relief knowing that week or whatever that you have a late start that day.
the, that Wednesday, and you can say, I don't know, this is just, this might just be how I work, but sometimes when I have so much to do, I get so overwhelmed that I don't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that seems counterintuitive, and it definitely is, and that's something I need to work on. But <laughs> <laughs> when I have that late start, or I know that late start's coming up, I can say, take a deep breath, Emma, step back, you can save this you can save X amount of work for tomorrow because you have that time in the morning and you can finish the rest tonight and be okay. <laughs> and it's really nice. And then sometimes if I don't have that stressful amount of work that I need to do, I can say, great, sleeping in. <laughs> and it's a great time. Yeah. And I think especially this is just another thing that I thought of probably because I was in a meeting about it today. From like a mental health standpoint for the students, because I know so many people who, even if it's just because SATs are coming up and AP exams, are just stressed out to the point where it's hard for them to like get up and come to school in the morning. But like, like having the late start, it's like, oh yes, that's like an extra hour of sleep we can get, or an extra hour of sitting and watching Netflix and letting myself <laughs> cool down and not being a giant ball of stress. So I think it's really helpful for the students. I'm trying to think of the word. Mental. Psychologically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to just have that extra like amount of time that they have to either work on their schoolwork, if it's something that they want to do, or to at least have that time to themselves to kind of decompress instead of going five days and then waiting until Saturday and then just laying on the couch for seven hours and not doing anything. So I'm a big fan. <laughs> and I think if we're pairing those benefits with the benefits that Mr. Creech has pointed out through the professional development and through the accreditation, I, I think that all of those benefits combined can really outweigh any of the maybe disadvantages that critics or someone who's a little anxious about it yeah. that they can bring up. I think that the benefits really can outweigh that. And maybe it's not ideal for that specific person, but you have to look at it on the whole. Mm -hmm. And for everybody in the district, I think it makes sense. Sound like a future school board member to me. <laughs> may, may I add? May I add one? <laughs> add one piece that I was I was hoping that I could end with. And and when I come to speak to you, I have a responsibility as a building principal to support the needs of Scarborough High School, most importantly our students and our staff. When I talk about this proposal, though, I'm talking about it from a person who's wearing many hats and has lived this. I know the benefits and challenges to this model as a teacher, a department head a parent and a school leader and it works and we can make it work and I wouldn't bring it to you or we wouldn't bring it to you if we didn't believe it in all of those arenas that it's possible and it can be effective. And I just have one more comment to make that um, I don't know that I'm necessarily sold on the every Wednesday just because um, we are trying to move away from professional development time being at the cost of instructional time, even though I understand the benefits to it, and if that's the only way to do it, I'm on board. Mm -hmm. But I would like to see us over time and including next year, invest more budgetary resources to paying for professional development outside the, sc the school day. Mm -hmm. So I would hesitate to have a calendar this year that's every Wednesday, and then next year either revert to the two or one or whatever the case may be. Maybe we'll hit the main state funding lottery and we'll have um, mm -hmm. no need for any but I'm just I'm concerned about if we are voting on a, a draft calendar tonight that's a significant departure from what was presented as an option that we'd be discussing tonight I would feel more comfortable tabling it and having a draft four circulate and then at our next meeting have a chance for the community to absorb it, have us have more time to think about it before we just jump right to, we got a few emails and that's, honestly, we did get emails from people saying let's do it every week if we're going to do it this number, but I would feel more comfortable tabling until we have um, more time to collect input and decide for ourselves. 
So before we go any further, Jackie, did you offer the first uh, uh, the first motion, motion. on on the fir uh, first amend the first proposal there? Was yes, it you? She did. I so couldn't remember who offered it. I, I didn't know. I seconded it. So thought. point of order, I just looked it up, and um, it does not go to the motion and the person who seconded it. At, when the friendly amendment is offered, the chair asks if there, any, if there are any objections. If there are an objection like this, then it goes to a vote from the whole committee. So is there, no, Christine? I, I, well, I have a, something. If we're looking to moving towards uh, starting school later next year, mm -hmm. this would then all become next year not this year it would become a moot point mm -hmm. so to do that, i think that's just one of the reasons why it, i think we just need to be slow the train a little bit if we are going to make such a big departure from what it is right now in the draft three form jody and then jackie um and then i also just had a clarifying question i guess on my understanding was that the additional late start was only for this calendar year yeah. coming up and you, you approve a calendar year, year to year. Each year. Anyway, the board so approves the calendar but year to originally, year. The original um, calendar had was the same. Were we at the same as we are this year? Yeah. And so then this draft three was presented just last week or whatever. My understanding was that it was just for this NEASC accreditation which is the, why there's a big the, N the, on them. The proposal that you're looking at in draft three is a proposed third late start specifically dedicated to NEASC. That was, that was what the request is and that was what the proposal is. And you approve the calendar year to year so it would stand for the 16-17 for the school year only. Yes, Jackie? I have uh, two points I, I would like to make. One is I agree with the parents who say that every Wednesday would be more in line with consistency. You don't have to worry about which Wednesday it's going to be. And secondly, I think if we are seriously considering <coughs> late starts on the school year, in other words, changing the starting times for students at the high school, and I'm just talking about the high school at the moment, then this might give everybody an idea of how that might work. So, mm -hmm. Anyone else? I am just disturbed in my head. I, I like to support what the administration thinks is in the best interest of students. And, and if that is draft three, then, then that is what I would support. So am I then hearing an objection to the friendly amendment? I object to it tonight, to vote on that tonight, just because I think it's such a big departure from what we presented to the public last week when we published draft three. So the last time at a meeting, we were at draft two, and then last week we just put it on the Facebook page. I just feel like we haven't given people enough notice to, um, to make such a change. And again, I'm not saying I'm for or against it at this point, but I just think that that's a big change that, that warrants some time, and then even at our next workshop meeting to have it be a new business item that we vote on then. So now it becomes a regular amendment and I need a second and it goes to vote. So I move that we adopt a calendar that includes every Wednesday as a late start. Is there okay. a second? Terry. Discussion? Yeah. Sorry, Jody. <laughs> I know, I'm like, <laughs> I, I agree with Kelly. And it's not for the reason that I don't support for, uh, late starts every week for the high school, because frankly, okay. I was gonna make that amendment tonight. So I'm in favor of late starts every Wednesday at the high school, but I will vote against approving that tonight on the basis of this, this needs to be a public document before we make such a drastic decision. 
Won't it become change. a public document? Because the motion will then become included, and then it, then it will be approved, and, and there will be no public input. But no. it will come back for a third reading. No. No. How do we make it come back for a third reading? We Here's vote down <laughs> your amendment. Christine? <laughs> so I guess ultimately I would say when is our next school board meeting that we could bring back draft number four? 28th. April 28th. April 28th. All of them. And then that would be the, well, it really would be what, a second reading of the first reading? <laughs> How would you want to determine that? It would just be, it's, it would it's be a, another. It's, it, we'd call it a final reading, I think, okay. is what we were, we're looking for. We're looking, looking for a vote, really. Is so that Thursday the 28th? Yeah. So would that be too late no, for us to be? Move to table to the next regularly scheduled meeting. As a draft four. No discussion on a tabling motion. Okay, well, I was still asking my question about how this was going to work, so now you're tabling this? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I guess my discussion is over. Well, no, Jackie, Christine, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so, so basically this would come back then on the 28th of April with a new draft for, and it would show us all of the late starts for the high school. Is that correct? Okay. If that's what you wish to do. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. So then we need to vote on the third draft. I vote. think you we first draft vote. You first you vote on my motion. You vote on her motion. Oh, yeah. First you vote on my motion, then you vote on the draft. Okay. So now we're we're voting on the amended, the amended, amended, amended motion to add a one fourth, late start a fourth late start each month. All in favor? Two? Two. Against? One, two, three. Three plus two and abstain. Jackie. Right. So now we go back to the original motion. The original, original motion. motion. And, and one, of, one of the things, and we can discuss it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I really want David to weigh in on is this is the proposal that was f supported by the Leadership Council as an equitable solution to the need for additional time at the high school. It was an additional, one additional late start. That everybody <laughs> always wants more time, but we really need more time at K2, at 3-5, um, at the middle school. The, this is, we worked on this hard. We looked at every option. We brought forth a conservative and what we believe to be equitable and appropriate response to getting the high school the time that they need to manage all of the things that they have on their plate. If we are just simply adding a late start for the purpose of having continuity, then what we're, what we're sacrificing is the, the equity factor, and I'm concerned about that. Hmm. So I, I, while I love the enthusiasm and excitement about it, um, and I do really believe, Jody, in your solution and Kelly, your solution in terms of this needs to be time that's embedded. With a new high school schedule, there are more opportunities to have more professional time embedded. So that's also coming down the line. This year, this was the equitable, appropriate, and reasonable solution that was, that was hit and supported by myself and, and the, uh, the leadership council. Would you agree with that, David? <laughs> yes. May, may I add to that? No. Uh, no. Yes. <laughs> yes. Is there, I mean, no, I, I don't want you to just say yes. If you have a, if you have a comment, <laughs> I'm feeling uncomfortable, and I was going to say that if we were going for, on a vote for the fourth, I'm feeling uncomfortable that that it appears as though, yeah, we'll, t we'll take it, and I know that there is, that's, a, that's a tempting thing to do, but we've got to be reasonable and we've got to be equitable, and I don't feel that going to a fourth one, given all of the consideration and all of the planning in terms of how to use the time, is, um, is the equitable or appropriate solution at this time. Comment? Christine? Well, so then 
if, if the suggestion from the Leadership Council, who really hasn't had much of an opportunity to weigh in on number four, but I'm getting the impression that number four would not be fair and equitable across the board so that number three would really be the thing that would be back on the table. Mm -hmm. Can we bring it is on, it's that? On the table. It's still on the table right now. We're talking about to vote so, on it. So we can still vote this in without going forward with the number four piece? Yes. Which, yeah. are, are you speaking for the high school when you say no to number four? Because it sounds like the high school is saying yes to number four. I, I, I would uh, David is the high school, so David? When you originally asked me the question, you were asking me whether the high school would benefit from all four late starts, <coughs> and the answer is yes. Dr. Entwistle's point is absolutely 100%. We're also teammates. The other schools need more late start time. They need more professional development. It's not equitable if one school has every late start and the other schools don't have any additional. So mm -hmm. I completely agree with that and believe that all of us would benefit from additional professional development time. So that's why my response was yes, the high school would benefit from another day. We originally, two years ago, asked for four because of all the reasons that have been stated here. But, but you're okay with three? We are. Okay. Jody. I guess my response um, to that is my hope for now, would it, would it be 2017, 18? I don't even know where we are. But my hope for that would be that we are then, in an ideal world, a schedule where the elementary schools are going earlier and could incorporate late starts for, for those schools. I feel like the, there's a, a strong resistance currently <coughs> with providing more late starts to the elementary schools on behalf of the public because it creates such a drastic change in that family routine with students who, frankly, work better earlier. So we're pushing off their day to almost a 10-15 start, which is counterproductive to their whole learning. <coughs> so in my ideal world, I don't mean to, to you know, rob Peter to pay Paul, but I would like to see us make a commitment to move to a schedule where the high school is starting later and the elementary schools are starting earlier when, when the students that work in those schools learn best. And so when that happens, I feel like I could support an increase in professional development for the other grade levels because it's not as a significant impact on the daily life of the family, of the, the learning of the students that are then going at a reasonable hour. That's my take on it. So I'm willing to give the high school a little extra this year in the hopes that, uh, one, it's more convenient for families and kids to plan and understand every Wednesday instead of this Wednesday, not that Wednesday, but also with the strong desire and the urge to really focus on flipping the schedule. Becky? Uh, you may not be able to answer this question today, but if in fact the budget passes with another day, another additional day, have, has a leadership team um, talked about how that time, that seven hours, will be used? Yes, it would be it would be coordinated as a team, but we would be sensitive to the needs of each of the levels that we are working with. It would be the simple answer is it would be embedded as work time in an extended work day on a certain schedule. It would only happen seven times because it's only seven hours. And, but I guess the question I really am asking, and I should be more specific, will it impact the calendar for children? No. No? Thank you. Oh, I yes. guess just one more thing to say about this. I, 
I understand the equity issues because I know we've heard from the K-8 principals that they need more time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like they're being really patient and waiting their turn. And the high school has extraordinary circumstances that require more time because of the accreditation. So that's, I'm comfortable with the three. I'm also sensitive to the practicalities of the families that have to live it. And if they're trying to remember, because it's not consistent every month, where the NEASC late start falls, it's, it kind of jumps around the calendar. It's going to be kind of a nightmare to just figure it out. I'm not saying it's beyond the capability of the families. We have far bigger challenges on a day-to-day -day basis with teenagers. But I'm saying that that's why I would, one of the only reasons I would um, support and it, you know, having it just be every Wednesday it would be for simplicity's sake. Yeah. Not because I don't think you can do the work. I, mean, I understand that the more time the better, but I feel like a sufficient amount of time is in here, including election day and including the seven hours we're adding um, in the budget. Um, I just don't see it to be 100% necessary to have it be every Wednesday, but I see the practical reasons for it. So again, I, if we're just voting on draft three, Mm -hmm. I'm ready to do that, but if somebody is going to, if we are still talking about changing it in some way, I think we need to table it and come back to it. Are we ready to vote? So sure. how do we decide to table it? Now, Jackie, you mentioned you wanted to table it. She didn't get a second. Well, well that, was that vote second? should have taken place first. There was no second on that. You could try again. I mean, seriously. Try again. I'll make a motion to table it until our April 28th uh, meeting so we can at least see a draft number four. I second. Okay. So now we need a vote <laughs> on uh, whether we are tabling it. Correct. Okay. So all those in favor of tabling this calendar Sample three. So we got one, two, three, four, five, and two, five plus two, and against? Yep. Two. It's tabled. So it's tabled. So we'll take this up again in a couple of more weeks. Do not, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to just vote for it. But it's uh, I guess what, what I would be looking for is some very specific um, expectations from the board about what you want to see on April 28th, which is extraordinarily late to be, um, to be as you know, I'm not saying anything. What, what I would really like to see from David, not to put more work on you, but, but maybe what you could do is, is give us an idea of how that fourth Thursday, or that fourth Wednesday would be used and to what degree it would be beneficial and, and how it could further enhance learning. I think that that would help us make a case for it. Ten point four, the first reading of the proposed FY twenty seventeen budget. Okay, um, th uh, these are uh, slides with a new look. Um, I credited Kate uh, with helping me uh, create a, a new look um, and basically repackage some of what you're seeing. Um, I did think that um, there, this is an opportunity uh, as well to really maybe think about it and think about the budget from a very student-centered perspective. And so um, I thought that this might be a nice opportunity to do that. So I, I wanted to introduce you to a couple of um, things that 
are maybe a little bit new, although um, you would indeed find them in your, um, in your packet. Uh, I went through the, um, the budget goals last night. I think the most important piece is that um, we have um, continued to have a focus of being student-centered in, in all of the work that we're doing. Um, that's not always easy. Um, uh, so in fact, sometimes it's very difficult. Uh, but we continue to remind ourselves and each other of how important that is. And I said last night, a student-centered budget is, is simply one that puts students first and basically um, is focused on addressing the needs of every student. Um, I think the other piece is that uh, this, um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the budget and the numbers that you already know and the numbers that I'll be reviewing with you tonight um, are, are really considered mission critical. I think we took a very conservative approach. Um, I think we feel happy with this budget, um, but it is really, um, it is mission critical not to say that it is, um, it truly is. And so uh, we, we are hoping that this uh, continues uh, through and is really not uh, changed uh, significantly. Um, from an, uh, a student-centered perspective, enrollment is particularly important. And um, you have a graph in your book, and I, I'm projecting it up here. Um, this was actually part of the uh, work that was done by the Long Range Facility Planning Team. And it was um, actually a request that came out of that team's work for some very specific and very deep study of enrollment because we were really feeling that the numbers that we had been working with uh, were really being skewed and that uh, the new housing starts were really um, uh, going to have an impact and we never really had a deep study as to how that might happen. So planning decisions got very involved with the town, uh, spent a lot of time with uh, specific uh, experts in the town in terms of planning and housing and permitting and all of that uh, business. And they essentially created um, a, a new model, and it is called the, uh, the new housing impact model. That compares to something that's called a best fit model. And uh, just to give you a sense of um, what that best fit model is, uh, it's basically um, a model that's based on three-year averages of births um, that are occurring between certain years, and then they also take a look at preschool in migration. So they're looking at some important things, and the, it's a typical demographic look. Uh, the, the fact is that the new housing model um, is really um, a, a novel and new model that's based on the best fit model, so taking that and looking and thinking about the live births and the in-migration to preschool, but then takes into account the impact of new housing development on enrollment. And that was kind of the missing piece as far as um, what uh, really uh, needed to be considered. So when you take a look at this uh, enrollment graph, uh, you can see that the barb I call it the barbed wire line um, is really the new housing impact. The uh, crisscross uh, that cons consists of the right-hand side of the, um, of the graph um, is the best fit projection. And even right now, at the, as we end, uh, or as we get towards the end of uh, 2016 school year, heading into 2017, as I said, we're over um, 3,000 students, about 3,013 students as of uh, just the other day. Uh, the other thing that um, has me believe that the the uh, barbed wire is going to be more uh, accurate and, and better uh, for us to make our decisions on is the spike that we saw um, in uh, 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 kindergarten enrollment um, and where we had larger numbers than we've expected. And we continue to have a number of um, new students uh, with uh, special needs uh, who are also um, moving into the district. So, um, and that is probably just part of the general population, but it feels like there is a general population move and that this is um, one of the places that has the potential for growth and so expansion of enrollment in schools. Another piece of uh, what I believe to be student-centered is uh, the, the uh, report that I shared with you all, uh, and it is from the um, the center at UMaine and the center at uh, USM, both research institutes, uh, that we asked to, um, to take a, a close look at um, Scarborough 
uh, particularly in terms of uh, the way that we've been spending money and our efficiencies, and also um, to include in that analysis um, uh, not only spending and, and efficiencies, uh, but outcomes in terms of student learning. And they did that. And we'll spend some more time on this uh, uh, perhaps tomorrow in the workshop. Um, but in looking at the data and looking at the report, uh, th these are the things that I took away from uh, what I was reading and, uh, and I believe is affirmed by the report. Um, so what it says is that Scarborough is poised as the district that is closest to joining the ranks of Southern Maine's five highest performing districts. That's where we're positioned. That's a good place to be positioned. As well, or yet, Scarborough continues to spend below the per pupil cost of all of those five high performing districts fairly significantly and also below the average of the other eight cohort districts that by um, student outcomes f follow behind Scarborough. Scarborough's recent investments have been targeted to improve classroom instruction. Have we, have we increased the school budget? Yes, we have. Where has the money gone into the classroom? Scarborough's investment in system and school administration continues to be well below all of the southern Maine cohort districts. So we have Scarborough, we have the high performers, five of them, and we have the other eight <coughs> cohorts. We continue to sp spend well below all of the other um, southern Maine cohort districts. Um, related to operations, maintenance, and other, and other includes career and technical ed education, transportation, buses, and other instruction. In terms of that spending, Scarborough invested at a level lower than all of the southern Maine cohorts. So I guess what I'm saying is, yes, this is a bit of a, an analysis of a, of a piece of time, but it's an important piece of time. It's um, from years 2012 through 2015. And those are probably the times that we've experienced the most change. And I think if we had data for this year, it would consistently support these five um, assertions that I am making uh, based on the research. So with targets of uh, improving uh, student learning and while also improving our efficiency, um, I would say at the very least, this study, um, as limited as it may be, just in terms of the data points and the, and the time examined, at the very least says uh, that we are um, definitely closing in on that goal of being in the high performing districts and also doing that as a very efficient operation. These are some of the, the uh, pieces that you saw last night and I'm going to run through these quickly. Um, level services, you all know what level services is. It's uh, basically what it's going to take to open the doors next year with the same exact programs that we have in place right now driven by those items up there, uh, salaries, wages, and benefits, uh, materials, resources, and equipment, energy, and utilities, and, and operations. And uh, the, just to uh, adjust and make that adjustment and reach level services would be a 2.8% impact in terms of an increase on expenditures. Part B is the education improvement plan. This is the part that's student-centered and the one that is, um, that is uh, basically created by the Leadership Council uh, in response to the needs and consistent with their improvement plans. Uh, the, the total no uh, number here allocated is $590,000. It ends up being 1.29% uh, of what's being recommended as the fiscal year 2017 proposal. There's uh, a whole list here. I love the list because I love things that are on one page that I can look at just on one page, um, as many of you do too. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't tell the full story. Um, every single one of these has a thoughtful story behind them in terms of what's happening with the students at each of these phases and e in each of these departments and at the district level um, that really should be read. And we provided that story uh, in, in the book. Um, but it does um, create the addition of 6.5 uh, new uh, FTEs, as I told you, 
filling those 6.5 FTEs would still leave us roughly with eight versus the number that we had back in um, fiscal year uh, 2009. We would be at a deficit of eight, still eight below where we were in 2009. Um, the total funds needed are, in order to do this are $770,000, of which $180,000 have been reallocated from existing funds, reprioritizing, moving things to what we believe gets a better bang for the buck. So that results in the $590,000 $590, request. Debt service, again, something that you all know, uh, is the amount that we are budgeting in each year to pay for the debt that we've incurred in previous years. Um, specifically, what we're seeing as an impact is the Wentworth uh, School. Um, and in terms of Wentworth School, as, as I suggested last night and the manager addressed, uh, there were some, that project has been closed, finalized, audited, and there are remaining funds that can only be used to decrease the, um, that debt burden in terms of the town. Um, but it uh, is shown, uh, uh, and, and some of that needs to be, uh, actually all of it needs to be spent as quickly as possible to be consistent with all of the parameters um, around bonding and so on. Um, and we show uh, that amount in the revenues. So it's basically the non-tax revenues to, bit to offset um, expenditures. And that's, uh, this is the chart where the non-tax uh, revenues uh, kind of join the bottom there and, and show the impact in terms of the 5.5% overall change in terms of uh, a tax request. A tax request is just that, it's a request. Uh, the town has a request. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, all of that is going to be paid with tax dollars. Uh, item still in motion, debt service uh, is still a, a moving target. Anthem rates are getting settled um, and there's likely to be an adjustment there. Um, enrollment, as I said, kindergarten registration um, spiking and uh, education needs uh, presenting themselves on a um, more significant basis. And other insurance premiums, I know that um, Kate was uh, working on those packages uh, just this morning. So those items are still in motion and adjustments will be made as we get to know um, uh, what the, the true costs are as those uh, um, costs get settled. Uh, here's the important schedule um, for budget adoption. Um, we have our uh, first reading uh, today uh, for, the, for the board, uh, essentially at your first reading yesterday with the town council and taking formal action today. Um, the leadership council workshop uh, along with the school board tomorrow, 12 noon, um, April th uh, 13th, um, between April 13th and May 11th. Uh, there are committee reviews by the town uh, on school finance committees, uh, that joint meeting, um, and uh, the big uh, night, I think, uh, hopefully, will be the budget forum on April 27th, that town, um, town hall style uh, Q&A session, and we're looking forward to that. Um, April 28th, uh, the school board uh, has its second reading, which is the adoption of the budget, uh, so that follows the budget forum. May 4th, the town council has a public hearing. They are obligated to have two public hearings. That's the second one. There's a joint school board and town council budget workshop. Um, and then the second and final reading or adoption of the budget by the town council on May 18th and the vote that is happening at the high school on June 14th. So there's no shortage of opportunities and tomorrow uh, we'll have a nice facilitated walk through this, um, this book that's been prepared uh, for everyone and we'll uh, have a chance to, to spend time with the leadership council members who can speak uh, very passionately and ver very eloquently to um, the requests and, and what's happening in their respective areas of responsibility. I would okay. suggest that you yep. would move forward on your uh, first reading motion. Mm -hmm. Do we have a motion on the first I, reading? I move approval to accept the Leadership Council's budget proposal as presented on April 6, 2016 for first reading. Second. Second. I'm hearing two at the same time. All right, thank you. Uh, any discussion, questions? 
I think we have a lot of hours All to right. ask our questions <laughs> tomorrow. All in favor? <laughs> Seven plus two. Thank you. <clears throat> and 11.0, a motion to go into what will hopefully be a brief executive session pursuant to MRSA subsection 4056A for the purpose of updating the board on the status of the superintendent's search, not to return to the public session. So moved. Second. Second. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you and good night. We have lost this here like